Uh, good afternoon and welcome to Nobody Prepared Me for Training During a Pandemic. Uh, my name is Clady Davis III and I'm the chair of the APIC Board of Directors as well as the training director at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, before we get started, I want to acknowledge uh, the work of Eddie Amin and Kathy Gruss for getting us together so we could support one another and hopefully learn from one another uh, today. Uh, so next slide. Uh, so here's our plan for the hour that we have with each other. Um, first, we'll start with some brief updates from APIC and APA, and then we'll hear from our distinguished panel of training directors who come from a variety of different training sites um, and hear how they're managing these, these challenging times. And then we'll move into a, a Q&A that'll be moderated from by one of the panelists as well. Okay. Um, so from, oh, reminder, yes. Please ask your questions using the question box uh, on the GoToWebinar dashboard. We'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible over the next coming days and weeks. Uh, clearly things are changing uh, on a daily basis uh, and you'll also receive a copy of this recording uh, by having registered for this webinar, okay? Thank you. So from APIC's perspective, as you might imagine, we are receiving daily calls and emails from students, training directors, directors of academic programs and loved ones of folks who are on training, expressing anxiety, confusion, even some anger, uh, sometimes even directed at APIC. Uh, as you might imagine, many of us are looking for direction and guidance for how to deal with these challenging times. And, and unfortunately, there's not one answer that's really gonna work for, uh, for all sites. And I think that's why you're seeing some, some pause in, in specific guidance. That said, yesterday, the APIC Board of Directors released a set of recommendations uh, that we're asking all sites to consider. Uh, and these recommendations are based on some guiding principles uh, that we'll share with you in a second when I turn it over to uh, Dr. Baker. But these principles include things such as recognizing the inherent power differential between the training staff and trainers, recognizing the fact that they have fewer financial resources, then also just the risk that many of our training staff uh, might face if they were to challenge uh, authority figures or institutional um, uh, directives. And so now we'll turn it over to Jeff to share a little bit of perspective about uh, some of these recommendations and what we're hearing and uh, especially what he's hearing in central office at APIC. Okay, thank you, Dr. Davis. You did a nice uh, job overview there. I wanna welcome all the training directors that are out there and so much appreciate the efforts that you're making to keep your trainees safe, as well as trying to continue your training program so that people can uh, continue and hopefully uh, complete their programs on time. Uh, the innovation and the creativity and the flexibility are so appreciated by APIC and of course the trainees as well. We just wanna make sure that everyone is aware that there is, APIC is not trying to prescribe something specific that you have to do, but we're trying to use these guiding principles that you can empower yourself to, to talk with the decision makers at your site in case you're getting some pushback or some resistance which there's such a wide diversity of settings out there that um, some are, some interns are still providing face-to-face -face service and some uh, directors of clinical training at the doctoral programs are pushing back about that a little bit. And interns are pushing back that they wanna do this and please stop telling us what we can do and what we can't do. So we're getting such a, a diverse uh, uh, response out there that we thought that this panel put together today would give you some insight or some uh, information about how different settings are dealing with this. And of course, we don't speak for everyone in that setting, but we put together a nice panel that will be able to give you some uh, insights about how they have managed to, to influence decision makers and how they have managed some of these resources. We realize that lots of people aren't quite ready to move to telehealth, but we continue to push push that because we don't think you're ready today. You're probably gonna be ready tomorrow or Friday or Monday because as this virus spikes at your site, most people begin to uh, feel a, a higher need to do this. Certainly our inpatient psychiatric facilities are the ones that are probably struggling the most along with the Bureau of Prisons and uh, some of the VA sites where it's kind of difficult to get this to move forward really quickly. Anyway, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Dr. Gruss who's gonna talk a little bit about APA's uh, responses. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Baker, and thank you, Dr. Davis. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the APIC board for uh, providing this opportunity to have a conversation uh, with the training community, and we're delighted to be part of this conversation. Uh, before I, I talk a little bit about what APA is doing, I'd just like to acknowledge the entire training community that's here today on the call and, and just recognize the challenges that you have been dealing with and, and will continue to deal with and, and how difficult I'm sure that makes your jobs. And, and that's compounded, I know, by all of us uh, facing different types of work environments, family concerns. Um, these are really difficult times uh, for all of us. So thank you for taking the time to participate in this webinar. And I really hope that we have a good discussion that uh, leads us to the goal that we've always had, which is to promote quality training. APA, like APIC, has been receiving a, a lot of calls, a lot of questions, a lot of emails, and we've tried to put together a lot of resources uh, for all of our membership, but in particular for the education and training community. Uh, what you see on the screen now is a snapshot from the main APA webpage. As you notice, it, it looks very different. Um, we have changed it entirely to focus on our response to the pandemic and providing resources uh, to our members. Uh, specifically to education, uh, we have created a whole section um, on that main pandemic page that you see referenced at the bottom of the slide. Uh, we have FAQs, additional resources there. Uh, please take a look at that for some guidance uh, that might be helpful to you. Uh, we do try to keep all this information up to date, just like the APIC website is doing. So uh, once we get new information, uh, we modify things and uh, get that out to uh, people via the website. So if we can go on to the next slide, I know a lot of people have had uh, particular questions about uh, accreditation status and what that means in, in this time. So I wanted to uh, show you an excerpt from um, some material that's on the APA website. So we have a statement from our Office of Program Consultation and Accreditation uh, that talks about uh, many things, but, but in particular, you'll see the, the quote that's up there on the screen, uh, just acknowledging that we are under very different circumstances. We are not operating as training programs, as business as usual. And in light of that, uh, the commission is acknowledging that issues related to telesupervision, telepractice, and distance education have to be handled differently in order to maximize training opportunities for our students. And in acknowledgement of that, um, they are saying that they are going to be flexible. Um, we've had requirements in the before, before but now flexibility is, is the main uh, message for the day. I'd really encourage you to take a look and read that full FAQ document. Again, that gets updated on a regular basis as we get new information. Uh, the commission will be meeting. Actually, they started their meeting today. They're meeting through the weekend. Um, I would expect that they'll have some further guidance um, after that meeting concludes, so you may see things even more updated. And if you have questions, uh, please reach out to our Office of Program Consultation and Accreditation. That's what they're there for. You can email them, you can call them. Um, they will get back to you and have a conversation and help you work through uh, your questions. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. And I'm gonna turn it over for our panel discussion. Thank you for being here, Dr. Gress. Uh, my name is Allison Osved, and I'm one of the APIC Board of Directors, and I'm here to moderate the discussion today. And what I'd like to do is start by asking each of our panelists to introduce themselves briefly and share what is happening at their specific site. Again, to Dr. Baker's point, uh, each site only represents itself, not necessarily a whole class or type of sites, but it can give a sense of what transitions are happening in certain training programs, and these are diverse training programs. So I will turn it over to Dr. Shona Voss to start with introductions. Thank you, Allison. My name is Shona Voss, and I am the training director at the University of Chicago Medical Center. I am also the secretary um, on the APIC Board of Directors. Um, I want to start by acknowledging that um, moving forward in a situation where there are no rules and, and none of us know what we should do is really challenging and I appreciate that we are all um, in this position together. So um, 
the situation in Chicago started to become um, fairly tense, I'd say the second week of March. So at the end of that second week of March, the 13th, I believe, we um, started by having all of our externs, we have 50 externs from graduate programs around the city, no longer come into work. Um, we're located in the Department of Psychiatry and we have a, adult and child services as well as um, some services that are um, embedded in medical clinics. Um, we have adult and child um, consultation liaison as well. Um, so we started with releasing the externs and having conversations with their graduate program directors about um, our decision making. Um, we, the following week, we put a plan into place um, for limiting face-to-face -face contact for our interns and for our postdoctoral fellows. We have five interns um, and about five fellows. And so everyone was working um, remotely um, as far as possible. Um, the biggest challenges we faced were actually with our consultation liaison services, um, both for peds and adult, um, because they involve inpatient care. And um, I can share a little bit about how we manage that um, later on. Um, and neuropsychological assessment. So our neuropsych um, clinics are currently um, shut down um, until we are given permission to, um, to reopen them. Everyone is providing direct face-to-face -face service um, via phone um, with the plan to move to Zoom within the next couple of weeks. We've been working on um, developing um, a, on a hospital-wide initiative for Zoom to be accessible to all trainees in addition to faculty. So I will stop there and um, turn it over to the next panelist. Thank you. And Dr. Carmen Cruz, would you introduce yourself? Let me unmute myself. As Allison just said, my name is Carmen Cruz, and I am the Internship Training Director at Texas Women's University Counseling and Psychological Services. I'm also the current ACTA president, um, and I'm happy to be here with everybody. Um, in terms of, I'll try to keep it very brief in terms of our center. I think it's very similar to a lot of university counseling centers that are not embedded within the student um, health services, medical health services. That has been a little bit more unique for other centers that are more embedded with their health center. Um, I think ours was a very typical blueprint where it was a daily and sometimes hourly contingency plan to figure out what were next steps. I think that's probably a collective feeling that many of us have had um, in terms of we create a plan, we write it up, and then suddenly you have to write up a new one or you have to modify it somehow daily, <clears throat> if not hourly. So we initially were preparing to have a skeletal crew, which I think there are still some university counseling centers um, throughout the country that are still going to the office um, in areas that are not um, in a state of emergency fully yet, seems to be the intersection anyway. so. It was, a, it was an initial rolling out of a variety of steps, starting with, again, a skeletal crew, little amount of people as possible, which only lasted for a few days. And then we were told within a couple of days we had to be off the campus once our city um, and our county declared a shelter in place. So I think that, again, is very similar to some of the trends that, um, and I know we're going to get to that, so I'll, I'll spare some time and let the next person go. And then on the line, we have a couple of panelists who weren't able to join us by video. So I'd like to ask Dr. Jeanette. Okay, thanks, Allison. Um, again, this is Jeanette Shu. I'm, coming, I'm calling in from the VA in Palo Alto, um, California. Um, we are a pretty um, complex, um, large hospital um, system here. And, you know, early in March, uh, we were responding to the um, the, the nation's first shelter in place order here in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area. And um, and I think, um, you know, echoing some of what other folks are saying about how quickly things have changed. And for those of you who are still kind of responding to sort of daily um, and hourly changes, that we've, I found that it took about two or three weeks before we went through um, 
all of the different changes that, that occurred at our site. Right now, um, most of our staff are still, we're essential workers within um, our shelter in place order. So m most of our staff are coming in at least um, part time, um, at least part time and part time teleworking. For our uh, interns and fellows, we uh, pushed forward quickly with trying to get them to have um, teleworking uh, schedules as quickly as possible, not only for their health and safety, but also knowing that many younger people are, um, have been carriers of the coronavirus. And so we wanted to protect our um, other coworkers and staff, also, uh, sorry, coworkers and patients also from, from exposure. So um, we, the trainees actually were ahead of the staff in terms of getting their telework plans in place and a lot of practical considerations in terms of, um, uh, you know, getting them um, uh, equipment to do that from home. Um, all of our uh, team meetings and, and uh, um, and didactics are all by Skype or Zoom, so there's no more gatherings in our in our VA of more than six people um, in a room um, with appropriate social distancing. I think one of the things that was really helpful, um, I think, um, as we already we were reflecting on what what has been working well for our trainees, and they've really appreciated, I think, a lot of the communication. In, in a crisis, people want information and they want communication. They want to know that um, they're also being responded to. And one of the things that I thought about early on is that as things were so uncertain, chaotic, and as some others were mentioning, change, things changing so quickly, I wanted to communicate to our trainees and to our staff some, some of the values that, that helped, I said, would help guide me in deciding training program considerations as we move forward. Um, uh, I, Knowing that I'm not a medical doctor and I can't I can't make medical decisions about you know um, whether people should be quarantined or what should what to do when you're sick, I said the first thing is well, I want to know that we're respecting the knowledge of our scientific community and the recommendations of public health officials, so that I would look to that guidance to those to that community um, to make decisions about health and safety. Also that um, you know we are all in a really important healthcare field, and that we care for our patients is really important. So I said that was our second another one of our values. Um, another value was passion for one one another and for ourselves, um, knowing that self care is going to be important for all of us. Um, helping with anxiety, helping our patients, helping with anxiety, supporting each other was going to be really important. And um, focusing on our training goals, and um, I really have appreciated APIC and APA. And our VA, VA, VA Psychology Training Council are putting out a, a lot of guidance about um, supervision and alternative supervision, um, remote supervision, um, all of those the changes in guidance that allows us allow all of us to do telehealth and telesupervision. Uh, so I'll say a little bit more in, in, when we respond to some other questions. But um, thank you for inviting me to speak. Thank you. And we have another panelist with us on the phone, Dr. Sharon Berry. If you could introduce yourself and share a bit about your site and where you are with this transition. I am very happy to be here and sorry for the technology issues. I am a training director at a children's hospital in Minnesota, and I am a former board member for APIC. I also want to talk a little bit about pediatric and child programs in general. Because my program is in an academic health center, I think we were fortunate to be able to be set up pretty quickly because we've been doing telehealth for some time. And if you can imagine in Minnesota, telehealth in the winter really has been helpful. So we've been ready to rock and roll pretty quickly, and the interns were as well. Um, we also want to highlight that many other agencies that treat children and adolescents have not had the same fortune as us that have been able to connect with other HIPAA compliant types of telehealth services. And now the door has been opened to phone conferences as well. So I think that will help many programs who have not been able to do telehealth as yet. The other thing I would like to highlight for people is knowing that as a training director, we are the only ones in our agencies who do this work. And therefore, very few other people really will understand what you are dealing with and how best to approach it and know that all of us and any of one of us on the panel will, will be willing to talk with you about options and to problem solve because we are following public health guidelines right now. And I, I really believe my interns get the grasp this, that they are professionals just like us. They're gonna follow the same guidelines we do. We do meet 
in person with physical distancing with small groups of under 10, and that's been possible, but we also can work from home and interns will do telehealth remotely with desktop access. So there are many options while they still understand our professional role. Most difficult in a hospital has been how to manage inpatients. And we have found that we can meet face-to-face -face with patients who do not have any precautions. And then we set up telehealth from there. And then that we don't even have to get in the way of medical providers and we don't have to use any protective environment um, material. So right now we just wear masks in the hospital unless there are precautions. So thank you for being here and I'll turn it over to the next presenter. And that brings us to Dr. Wayne Siegel. Okay, I think I you're can, muted. Okay. I think you can hear me now. So the theme is lots of uncertainty and that's what we've had here in Minneapolis. I'm a training director at the Minneapolis VA. Um, I've been doing this for 22 years. We have a large internship postdoctoral program with specialty training in neuropsych and rehab. Um, so lots of uncertainty. Starting about three weeks ago in the middle of the day, the two major universities here pulled their practicum students and we weren't even notified. So we found out after the fact and then kind of everything broke loose from there. That Sunday, again, about three weeks ago, I called from the chief of staff late in the evening. They're pulling all trainees out of the medical center, including my interns and postdocs. So it's a good example of them not fully understanding the role and the services that they provided and how this would disrupt care. Um, mid next day, they were told to come back on site. And then later in the week, they were told they could telework 50%. And then in the last week, it's been 100%. And we've really been focusing on social distancing and decreasing communication. Um, many um, facilities that deliver healthcare center for good reason are rule driven. The VA sometimes takes that to a new level. So this has been a stress beyond um, comprehension for a very rule driven system. So many rules have been broken. Um, it's been challenging to figure out which rules we can break, which rules we can't break, um, focusing on kind of doing the right thing, providing quality services, um, following good ethics, privacy, where we can do all of that. Um, changes the rule. We've really communicated this with our trainees, trying to be super transparent, um, letting them know this is what we're doing today. This could change in the next hour, tomorrow, next week. Um, things will clearly be different in two weeks from now. Um, um, acknowledge the challenges, the power differential, um, the inefficiencies that we all have, including myself. I've given, done a lot of self-disclosure. Um, this has been engaging and challenging, but also there's times when I stare at my computer and don't know what to do, even though I have a hundred things to do. Um, also would add, I've really been impressed with the professionalism of our trainees, how they've really kind of stepped up. Um, and managing um, all of this. And so there'll be more I can say later. Thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, we really appreciate your time and being here. And uh, I think the sentiment that we want to share with everybody who's joined us on the webinar today is that we are all in this together, figuring it out together. And so these are just some lessons learned and strategies from some of your peers. And we welcome your questions and ideas we prepared some common questions that we received via registration and that we've received through our consultations prior to this webinar. So we'll launch with those prepared questions and then we'll also have time for Q&A from the audience today. Um, so the first question I'm gonna ask each of the panelists to just chime in in brief, uh, something that they perhaps haven't shared as part of their introduction, which is what kinds of trends and or issues have you been seeing in your type of internship or postdoctoral training setting since this pandemic began? I can start us off. Oh. Go ahead, Shona, I'll go after you. I um, wanted to acknowledge that it seems like the biggest tension in an academic medical center is that we are all healthcare providers, including our trainees. And the trainees, like Wayne said, I think really want to be a part of that 
workforce and take their responsibilities very seriously. And so the tension that we have experienced has been um, between ensuring trainee and employee safety and providing those um, patient services. And um, so we have tried to think about how we can address both of those issues um, simultaneously. So um, in working remotely and providing um, didactics and supervision remotely, we've been able to keep some aspects of the training program intact um, while recognizing we have a, a big child and family clinic. Kids are not really set up to do therapy by phone. And so there have been situations where some of our child interns have come in for a couple of cases. When they're on site, we um, limit um, the number of people in a room, um, how many days they come in. So we try and have it just be one afternoon, um, if possible, um, for our consultation liaison services. Again, we're doing some virtual rounding and having um, just one person go into the room um, and um, do virtual rounding with the team. Um, we've met, been actually surprisingly been able to manage a lot of those um, consults by phone as well. Okay, so for University Counseling Centers, the trends, um, some of the initial issues were being a leader, trying to be a leader and how every level of leadership that was at the university, within your center, within the university, and then in the city, et cetera, et cetera, of like who's making what decision when and waiting and waiting. Um, so I think the initial push was creating telehealth forms, figuring out HIPAA compliant platforms, all of that collective stress that I would imagine is true for most people. <clears throat> I think that one of the hardest things for a lot of training directors and university counseling centers has been letting go of the practical program and you know feeling some emotion about that. It's hard to um, just pause somebody's training and just cease a practicum program. I think that's been really hard. There are a few, there are several who are still going forward with it, but it is less common in terms of a trend. Um, so it's more common that interns are staying intact and the training program um, seminars, for instance, has been like, how many seminars can we continue to have online on Zoom? And how much Zoom can people tolerate for eight or nine hours a day? Um, going from Zoom link to Google Hangout or Google Meet link to another platform, depending on who you're meeting with. So I think there's also been some technology issues with some staff who have maybe are not as comfortable or really don't prefer technology. Um, and then I think that the biggest thing has been about what do, what happens if we do, they don't make their 500 direct service hours. I know that that's been like a huge concern overall. Um, unfortunately, the, C, the COA is being more lenient and starting to give more and more direction all the time related to that, which is wonderful. Um, and I think training directors at university counseling centers are being really creative in figuring out ways that their interns can do work from home that would count as direct service, um, including, of course, providing services um, online for students, whether that's telephone or video. Um, and then I think this a last piece I'll comment on is um, dealing with, and I'll comment on this a little bit more later, but working with your interns um, and their feelings about all of this um, while managing our own, while managing staff feelings and our own families and sort of all the intersections of that. So I'll say more about um, trainee emotions in a little bit, but those are some general trends for UCCs. Any other Maybe panelists I'll, wanna, thank you, Jeanette. Oh, I was gonna say, um, I was gonna just jump in, this is Jeanette again, um, Palo Alto. And I think um, for, for our program, a really large VA program, um, we have 15 interns and 13 postdoctoral fellows, um, clinical postdoctoral fellows. And so, as you might imagine, that everyone's doing all different things. And one of the things that we see here and it's been okay doing is that every rotation and every, um, every intern or fellow has um, worked with their supervisor to develop an alternative training plan for this period of time, however long it's going to go on for, that involves either full or part-time telework, um, alternative projects, um, the focus on getting them direct service hours, not only to, um, uh, you know, to patient, patient care, but also to um, supervision of 
um, supervision and consultation to other other trainees from other disciplines, um, uh, and also providing in services for staff. Um, so, so we're, we're we're being really creative. I think um, I want to echo what Wayne said too about how um, and, and others have said about how well I think the trainees are 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 working with this, are really resilient, um, and take their their healthcare mission um, uh, seriously. Um, and, and also have, you know, uh, understandably concerns about their health. And I think um, uh, I can talk more about some of the self-care issues um, later on. But I did want to mention that I took a um, suggestion from Amy Silverbogen from Boston VA, um, who said that she set up virtual office hours. And so, um, so I have twice a week virtual office hours for interns and fellows via Zoom. And people have been joining that. And that's been a really nice way to connect with them. Um, and also kind of keep a pulse on um, how they're doing beyond all the practical um, considerations of how, how to make their training plans work. Thank you. Yeah, one of the trends, or it's not a trend, it's a trend I'm anticipating happening. So we've done similar to what Jeanette has described. Um, we have our rotations due to shift on the 10th of this month. And so we're planning there's rotations that just don't exist anymore. Um, and that wouldn't be a very meaningful training experience. But and, and reality dictates that um, whatever we think they're gonna be doing in two weeks is gonna be very different, particularly as staff start to get sick and people are out, supervisors are gonna to have to shift and we're developing contingencies um, for what that's going to be. So just flexibility, being adaptable, is really the, the name of the game because we just don't know what this is going to look like. Um, having guiding principles is really important in terms of no matter what, these are things that we pay attention to as Jeanette noted. This is Sharon. I just wanna say one more thing from a child program where um, assessment is a very big part of our internship. And so we've been really struggling about how to do that. And because the door is now open, to testing virtually and using um, mechanisms like Q Interactive and things like that, we are trying to develop some protocols and that we will screen very carefully and see individuals in person um, when it's not possible to do it through video, which you don't want to eliminate an entire training experience and one in which we expect competency, but luckily, we're in the final six months, and our goal is to help interns be ready for their postdocs, which are already planned, so that they don't worry about delays in life changes. Often moves are involved, things like that. So that's, that's another thing that people are working on, and the door is now open in many ways for billing purposes. For people who don't bill, it may be a little bit easier. Thank you. Thank you, panelists, for those responses. Our next question, oh, go ahead, Shona. I just wanted to say that in a medical center, one of the big challenges that we are facing is that our providers who are on the front lines, our doctors, our nurses, our um, medical assistants are completely overwhelmed um, and very, very frightened. And so one of the uh, pieces we have put into our program in our institution broadly is a resilience program and our trainees are a big piece of that. So we have a weekly community, a daily community Zoom meeting with um, resilience activities, with um, antidotes to compassion fatigue, with mindfulness and um, resilience activities. We have a uh, nine to nine um, provider hotline for people can call uh, so people can call to speak with a peer supporter that is staffed by um, many of our trainees. And almost like DBT, we have a team consultation once a week for, for people to connect and, um, and share their experience in providing this service. And, and um, we feel like that goes a long way towards attending to sort of our own distress as well as supporting each other as a community. That's a great example. Thank you for sharing it. 
Our next question is along the lines of competencies. So, uh, and this one is for Dr. Wayne Siegel. So how are you maintaining a focus on high quality training during the current pandemic? For example, certain competencies in our training programs do not necessarily lend themselves well to virtual training, yes. psychological wow. assessment, neuropsychological assessment. And how have you managed to address developing these in your program remotely? So to be completely transparent, we've not given a great deal of thought to these are our programs to find competencies and how are we meeting them. We've approached this more from how can we provide meaningful experiences to our trainees and ensure supervision. Um, initially, when people started to go off site, um, we were focusing on, okay, what can we do under these circumstances? And initially that was working on research projects. Um, there was didactic and structural learning. Um, supervision, we were providing that remotely and any professional development activities and then blending in clinical services as much as we can. Testing has been really hard because we've done no face-to-face -face contact with, um, with um, testing. We do none now. We're trying to figure some of that out. With neuropsych testing, we have done some um, telemedicine or VTEL assessment to our remote clinics and we're trying to implement some of that internally where the patient would be in a room um, but those are only cases where there is really a critical question that needs to be answered for decision making now and not like a follow-up testing so if there's not really a critical need we're just not doing that we hope that this will evolve over over time um, you know quality training oversight um, you know, each person has a plan. Daily um, emails with a summary of what they've done for that day goes to their supervisor, to myself, assistant director, um, to kind of track what's going on. Um, clinical work was initially telephone um, contacts. A challenge with that was, um, you know, I have an office in my home, but many of our interns and postdocs do not. So do they have a private place where they can kind of have um, contact with a patient, whether it be telephone or video. So having discussions about that, how can we ensure that some boundaries needed to be challenged that we were asking people like what's going on in your home and can we kind of figure that out, but it was necessary. Um, you know, empowering our interns and postdocs to use good decision-making um, and so that they know when to check in. Lots of freedom, very lucky, very talented intern and postdoc class. And uh, we do have a lot of trust in them. And so um, helping them understand when do they really need to check in, making sure that they have um, multiple contact points for myself, all supervisor staff. When questions come up, they can call, contact us at any time to ensure that those things can, can be done. Um, stressing for them to take care of themselves, but also that they have professional responsibility. They chose to come to a, a training program in an academic health center we have to take care of our patients. Um, and there's a balance to that. Um, um, I, I will, what, one more thing, I will um, admit supervision has been a challenge initially, like staff had to be reminded supervision still has to occur on a regular basis, even if it's not related to um, direct patient service. And so I think we finally have got that message across and that it is occurring on a regular basis. The transition to video supervision has been really helpful. Um, the quality and the, the quality of supervision is much better. I'll stop there. Ellis, can I just add one more thing to that one comment to keep in mind is that with many of the telehealth options, you can also um, observe through this mechanism. And so the, the mandate that we observe our trainees every evaluation period really can happen through these telehealth models. Thank, thank you to both of you, um, important points. And, and Wayne, your second to last point was a nice segue uh, into our next question actually, which is how are you maintaining focus on quality care for service recipients in the current pandemic while protecting their health, the health of trainees and the health of staff? And so this one is for Shona. I um, spoke about that a little bit. We really have not experienced any interruption in the services that our patients have received because we transitioned to phone 
um, almost immediately. Um, I think one of the challenges that we have faced here is sort of the evolving guidelines from CMS and billing and um, what's okay and whether you can do Zoom and what's HIPAA protected and whether you can work across state lines if patients go somewhere else. And so, so um, we have um, sort of a space for those questions to go, to go up to institutional leadership and um, also have been very appreciative of um, guidelines that have come from APA as well as from our state government about insurance reimbursement and some of those questions. So um, our patients have not really in, um, experienced any interruption in their services. Some of them have chosen to wait, but given that the stay at home order in Illinois has now been pushed back to April 30th, it might be a while. Um, um, supervision also has continued as scheduled. As the training director, I put in an extra half hour weekly check-in with all of the interns together. Um, and then I have a weekly seminar with them. Um, and we missed one week, but we have jumped right back on track and all of their didactics are virtual at this point. Thank you. Um, and speaking of extra time with your interns and postdocs, uh, the next question is, how are you addressing the emotional needs of your trainees during this challenging time? And this goes to uh, Carmen and Jeanette. All right, well, I'll get us started. Um, a few first thoughts. One thing that I first started <clears throat> that I talked with my trainees about was that the timing of this, although never would it be good, it's better than if it would have happened in October in terms of a training cycle. Um, and that we felt confident in their abilities and their competency, even though, of course, supervision will continue and telesupervision and all and the didactics and the training seminars. Um, but I feel like that helped the staff and the interns feel a little bit better in terms of, can you imagine if this what this would have happened in the fall? I think it would have been a very different landscape for us in some ways. <clears throat> so in terms of the emotional needs is recognition of there is going to be, there are going to be so many different emotions depending on the personalities and contextual life issues for each person. Um, and we're talking about a lot of different people. So overall, um, in our listserv, we've had conversations about how to manage different reactions. Um, so I think initially there was um, sort of like this, oh my gosh, we're administrators, we have to do this, we have to do that. And then it was like neglecting the trainees potentially for about for a few days. And, um, and I think that there was sort of like a recalibration of, okay, let's devote some extra time. So I think Similar to what Shona shared, it's like having extra time, a little bit like having intern support time, making sure that um, you're checking in with them, but also empowering them, similar to what Wayne shared, um, to share what they need. And, um, and at this point in their career, they need to be able to do that as well. Um, and if they, and so I've said, if you need extra time, you can reach out to me. So I think that little personal touch goes a long way. And I know the first time we met, it was a lot around like, How's your space? How are you feeling in your home kitchen or bedroom turned into an office with a sheet behind you or whatever it happened to be for that person? So I think just intentionality, like if you inject intentionality into the relationships with the trainees, I feel like that can be really successful while at the same time holding the line and holding the boundary that we need to as directors of training, um, even if they may have different attitudes about why are we still doing, why do we have to read these articles? Like, can't we just let this go now? We're toward the end. And it's like, well, it's not that much at the end, but it's close. Um, so I feel like being able to hold the both and always is really important of honoring their emotions and, and being there for them and doing our job and what we've been charged to do, um, I think is a balance. Shona has her hand up. I I just wanted to add one more uh, point to emotional health and balance and um, note that many of our trainees are parents and so they are also in the position of having to take care of children at home because daycares are closed and schools are closed. So how do you do your full-time job while taking care of a two-year-old? If you listen closely enough, you will hear my children galloping in the hallway outside this room um, which is why I'm mostly on mute, but I think that acknowledging that it's not, it's not 
going to be possible to do your job in the same way and we recognize that and it's okay. Thanks, and Jeanette, did you have uh, comments you can add as well? Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, one of, one, of the, one of the things we wanted to do um, as we we're moving towards all this, um, you know, physical distance and, and remote technologies um, and connecting, you know, kind of without being in the same room is, is, is how to, how to um, carry on the sort of supportive atmosphere and relationships that we've ha already developed. And I want to echo Carmen saying that I'm really glad actually that it's not, it not, was not at the beginning of the year that we have good relationships already established um, among all of our trainees with each other, but also with supervisors and with myself. So that was helpful um, as we, started this um, crazy journey together. Um, but you know, how, how do you translate that into these remote technologies? And I, I mentioned having the virtual office hours, which I think is really helpful. Um, uh, I think that um, letting, as Wayne said too, let, letting all of our trainees know like how to reach all of us at, at, in any way. I, I usually don't give my personal cell phone number out to trainees until after they've graduated. Um, but I said I've put all of their cell phones into my personal cell phone and, you know, they can contact me for urgent issues anytime. Um, and so we would all know how to reach each other. And I think that that's, that they're knowing that, that I'm available is really important. Um, and, and, and also that I think, just um, normalizing that we're, we are all going to be, I try to model this too, we're, you know, just being transparent that as much as we're all very highly ambitious, like hardworking um, people, that during this time we're, we are going to be pulled in many different directions. We have uh, loved ones that are far away from us. We have loved ones also very close in our own, very in our home um, and in each other's space all the time. Um, and, and that it's important um, it's going to be really important to just acknowledge that we we are not going to be as productive as we might have expected to be. Um, to acknowledge the disappointment um, that that they're not getting the training uh, experience that they anticipated, and to reframe what they're what they're um, getting right now, which is a live you know supervised experience of like um, of how to cope in, in a crisis, and that that that's also very valuable exper experience, and that they can learn from that. A lot of our postdoc fellows, especially, are thinking about like how um, looking to us and saying how um, how can we be leaders, you know? And then looking to us to say what are, who are the models of leadership that are seeing that is working, that are working in this crisis. Um, and I think all of those acknowledgement that, that just normalizing our, our responses and being human and authentic with them um, has been really helpful um, for um, uh, for just supporting them in their self-care. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you. And then this next question is for uh, Sharon. And um, have you experienced uh, tensions from the doctoral program sending their students to your internship in terms of their expectations for your interns given the pandemic? And if so, how have you navigated them? And if you have not, how would you recommend that others navigate such tensions? Thank you. You know, I've been very lucky and I have not had any tension with the doctoral programs, but it is a really important time to highlight and remember our collaborative partnerships with the doctoral programs as we jointly share these interns and get them to graduation. So if you haven't reached out to them at this point, it would be a great time to do it. And I do think that there are programs that have had some tension. And part of the trick is systems work in a vacuum many times and don't have any knowledge or consideration for for what's happening with trainees from other states. And we all probably felt some of that with FLSA standards coming out and many of our programs not really um, respecting the legal consultation that APA obtained for us. And so we're all kind of fighting within our own systems to help them understand this training world. So I think part of it is when you get mandates, to really consult with APIC, who can help you to talk with others, um, to take advantage of moving up the hierarchy to talk with people to see who, who can best advocate for you with exceptions to any mandates that are happening. 
So I, my interns have been set up as employees, and in many ways that helps because nobody is targeting them as trainees at this point, whereas medical students are out of the hospital. They're no longer here. And so some of it is really stay in touch with the doctoral programs but really work carefully with any mandates that anybody is getting. And I suspect others have some ideas about that as well. Does anyone else want to chime in on that one? Um, this is Jeanette. I want to add on one, one thing about what Sharon uh, said about contacting um, graduate programs. Um, about a week or so ago, I, I, did, I think it was helpful just to send out, to preemptively in a way, send out a message to all the DCTs of our of our interns and just describe to them what what has happened um, in, the, in, in terms of changes in our training plans for our, all of our interns and how we're assuring their safety um, and health. Um, and I think that really reassured them that they kind of know what's going on with their student. Um, and maybe for some of you may um, prevent some some um, uh, additional well, I guess if it reassures them, then then you then maybe you've headed off some other um, concerns from their from their end. Thank you. So now we have another question from the chat or the uh, questions today, and there's really two parts to this theme. It's a common question. So one uh, for the panel, if someone on the panel would like to take this, is what recommendations do you have if you can't implement telehealth due to the nature of your setting or restrictions in your institution? And then also an equity and social justice component to that. What if you're serving populations that really are um, on the other side of the digital divide and they can't engage in telehealth due to lack of resources? So either side of that, um, comments would be much appreciated on that. And I'll, I'll turn that to the panelists. Well, this is Sharon again. And my interns do bill for everything they do. But the we now have, we follow the reimbursement guidelines very co closely. And there are now codes for services by phone. And so for those families who absolutely have none of the devices that we think about, we are really working to screen them to see them in person if it's an acute situation. And if not, we are doing phone services. And I think we all feel pretty comfortable with that, that we're not, um, it's not sneaky, it's not backdoor, it's really valid right now, and it's really important. So that's how we're doing it, um, particularly if they're old enough to talk by phone. If you've got a four, five, or six year old, that's really impossible unless it's behavioral management with parents. Um, so um, those are some of the ways that we're working with it. Um, our institution is on the south side of Chicago, and so we, our patient population is faced with many social and economic challenges, and the um, institution has set up a fund for patients whose care is interrupted by this crisis, so we have been able to get um, digital access, laptops, iPads, um, devices to families that really need them um, if they haven't been able to utilize services through their phones. So, so again, we, we are trying to think about our training program as just one piece of the larger community, both in terms of um, who we serve and how we can continue to make our services accessible. Okay, uh, the next question that again represents a common question or theme from our audience today is what are people doing regarding direct service delivery hours requirements either for licensure jurisdictions that you're tracking for your uh, graduates for APIC with the 25% of training needs to be direct service or for APA standards? How are people being creative in their thinking and, and finding ways to meet those standards under these circumstances? I can start with that. This is Carmen Cruz. Um, I so the obvious first is phone or video telehealth provision. Um, unfortunately, our interns and most interns are not able to continue supervising who they were supervising. So that, uh, that again, the timing does help. But I think the other most common, a lot of ACTA members got 
their heads together and people were sharing a lot of ideas. And I would say the most common are to create um, deliverable pa uh, products essentially to the student body um, on through virtual means and posting things on our social media. And they're, so they're creating things that can be left and sort of this legacy that they'll leave at our center of during this time and this is very um, unfortunate time that they were able to create products that will be used for students for a while because they'll be up on our website or social media um, and those are in terms of counting those as direct service it feels fair to do that um, if they're delivering that service and creating um, how to cope with COVID-19 how to transition to online and have to move back with your family and things like that for that's unique to obviously a university counseling center um, so that's that's just one contribution in terms of what we're doing in university counseling centers. I wanted to add that it's important to think about direct service hours over the course of the year and not just at this time. So if you have a certain number of hours that your trainees are expected to get, um, which is 2000 for APIC and varies from state to state, think about how there might have been other times of the year where they worked more than that and um, average that out over the course of the year so that if they're a little bit lower right now, maybe it is okay. Any other comments about hours? Yeah, Carmen. I was gonna say one more thing. I, I feel strongly about this too, in terms of quantifying competency has, has always traditionally been tough. And I think that, you know, I'm asking myself, am I, do I feel like this person is ready in July, you know, with a few more months of experience, however that is, to be out on their own and be at a postdoc level, at least in the internship level, right? And so how do we quantify being part of a group that's not gonna get this training maybe again? And this is a very unique experience in learning how to cope with something like this. Um, so do we say, oh, you get 25 hours for learning how to cope with a crisis, you get 50? You know, we can't, it's really hard to quantify. So I think it, at some level it becomes incumbent upon us as gatekeepers and having that gatekeeper role of what are we willing to sign off on? I think the complication, I know I've had a few training directors reach out, they've had a remediation plan in place. That's a huge complexity to this, which is hard to answer in a very quick minute. But um, I, would, I would urge folks to think about using their, their power with really from a very, um, feminist multicultural way of working with trainees to be able to graduate as many people as we can um, without bending the rules essentially, or breaking them, maybe bending them is what I wanted to say, without breaking them. And I think going back to Kathy's comments at the beginning, we, um, I think that everybody is going to be flexible with requirements and adjusting those um, because this is a universal situation. So numbers are going to be less important in terms of thinking more flexibly and creatively about how we're addressing competence. Well, I'm aware that we have two minutes in our webinar left and so many more questions. Um, so I, I wanna um, point out that uh, one thing too, when it comes to our unique circumstances, consultation is so key. So I really recommend if people are in institutions that just prohibit phone contact or telehealth contact for some reason, reach out to your colleagues in other similar institutions, reach out to APIC and APA's Office of Consultation and Accreditation to consult on what you can do for your unique circumstances. So that's one thing that I think is really important. And another thing that I'd like to note is we will take the themes from the questions that were typed into the chat today and the questions today as well as that were part of registration and we'll add those to the FAQs related to COVID that are on APEX website already. So that's something that we'll be working on. So if we didn't get to your question today because we know there are so many, please know we'll be addressing those themes over time. Um, and I really want to give a big uh, thank you and express my gratitude to the wonderful training directors who've served on the panel today. It, in times like this, it is so nice to um, kind of fall into the arms of our colleagues, virtually, so to speak, uh, for support as we try to sort this out together. So we just wanna thank all of you for taking the time uh, to share your experiences and everybody who joined us for taking the time to be here with us and don't hesitate to reach out. And I think that brings us to the end of time.
So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Stay safe. Thanks, everyone. Bye now. All right. Oh.